I say, we shall commence. Hello and welcome to the book launch of the second edition of Oppression, a Social Determinant of Health. My name is Oyinda Mola Alaka and I'm the Publicity and Promotions Manager for Fernwood Publishing. I'm excited to kick, out, kick off this event. And to start off, I would like to acknowledge that I am calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty One Territory, the original lands of Anishinaabeg, Cree, Ojikri, Dakota, and Dene's peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the arms and the mistakes of the past and the present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. As an immigrant to this land, I recognize my privilege as a settler on this land, and I dedicate myself to working in partnership with Indigenous communities in my location. Tonight's event is brought to you by Friend Republishing. You can order a copy of Oppression via our website, friendrepublishing.ca. It is currently 25% off till June 23rd at 11.59 EST. The direct link to purchase this title will be posted on the chat. Some housekeeping before we start, there is a live chat on your screen. Please leave any questions and comments there. There'll be an opportunity towards the end of, this, um, towards the, end of the event for the speakers to answer any questions you have. The chat has been monitored and any sexist, racist, homophobic, transphobic comments will be deleted. There's also an option for closed caption. Uh, to access it, please, please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please stay muted unless a host unmutes you during the question and answer session. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted on Fernwood, Fernwood's YouTube channel after. If you're not comfortable being filmed, please turn off your cameras. The question and answer segment of this event will not be recorded, so you're welcome to turn on your cameras back on then. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our host for today, Dr. Patty Hansen Ketchum. Dr. Patty Hansen Ketchum, RN, PhD, is the director for the School of Nursing at St. Francis Xavier University. Pat teaches courses in health promotion, health systems, leadership, and research. Her program of research is an integrated focus on environmental health and health promotion. Patty will be moderating the discussion today with editor Dr. Elizabeth Magibbon, guest and contributors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patty. Hi everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, St. Effects, uh, our launch here at St. Effects is in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, this treaty, is covered in the Treaties of Peace and Friendship signed in 1726. And uh, we also recognize the, the uh, devastating impacts of colonization and historical trauma. And we use this acknowledgement to serve as a reminder of truth and reconciliation, as well as the learning and unlearning and action uh, that is still left to be undone, left to be done. Um, I'm also honored to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth McGibbon the editor of the book, uh, Oppression, a Social Determinant of Health. Dr. McGibbon is, is a professor here at St. Evax um, and principal investigator of, of the SHRC project entitled Mapping Health Equity, Discourses in, in Canadian uh, Public uh, Policy. So I'll hand it over to Dr. McGibbon who will introduce the book. Thanks, Patty, and thanks to Oyinda and uh, Bev Rock, Errol uh, Sharp, and Brenda Conroy for their Fernwood support. Uh, and I also stand on the shoulders of, of a lot of people here today, including the community leaders in my own family. Before I became a, a professor, I worked for a number of years in as a mental health clinician in inpatient psychiatry, community mental health, and also urban emergency rooms. Uh, during that time, I was offered, uh, sorry, I, um, I wanted, uh, I applied for a job that I really wanted. And I found out afterwards that the reason I didn't get the job was, quote, she'll go in there and try and change everything. So at the time, I'm not sure I took that as a compliment, but I sure do now. Um, in terms of uh, who I am and what I have to say. And each of the generous and um, 
uh, thoughtful authors of this book are about this urgent kind of action. Um, I started to tally up the years of community and political activism among the group um, that, uh, and that underpins this book. And it's, it's over 150 years. If we add the, the, the same for our guest speakers, we're, we're way up there. So, you know, that righteous anger about uh, political government decisions about who suffers and who doesn't and who dies and, and who doesn't. Um, so it's very important to, to uh, make those distinctions. And, and another distinction that um, I start the book with is the distinction between vulnerable populations and people under threat. So when we think of vulnerable populations, we think of people who are more prone to catching something such as catching a cold. So there's something bad in the air. A, a much more accurate description is uh, people under threat. Um, and there are so many recent examples, historical examples and recent examples. And here I, I take a moment to honor the, um, the indigenous children who are buried in re Indian residential school grounds across this country. Um, in the, the survivors of Indian residential schools and the 60s scoop are under threat right now as the um, Canadian government is uh, fighting a court order to, that was put forward by the Canadian Human Rights uh, Tribunal to compensate these people for harms done to them by the state. Uh, actually, that's on Aboriginal People's Television Network now, um, I believe, uh, uh, the proceedings are, are on. So, so many examples of this notion of being under threat. And uh, COVID-19, of course, is uh, a very unfolding example of who is under threat of suffering and dying and who isn't. Uh, Bill C-21 in Quebec um, and all of the... Um, the axis of disadvantage or axis of all the isms, so racism, genderism, classism, and so on, uh, that underpin uh, who actually is under threat and who isn't. Um, I want to now give you a, a bit of an overview of the book. These ideas are integrated in the book um, to give you a sense of how they all come together. Uh, and, and although the chapters are discrete, you, you will notice um, uh, when you read the book, that they all intersect very nicely uh, because they're all coming from that uh, very political um, stance about naming who's under threat and naming who the perpetrators are so that those perpetrators can be held accountable. So it's that accountability piece that, uh, that uh, is often missing and you're really going to see that uh, in the book. Um, so part one of the book is about politicizing health. So it's an overview of how is oppression a determinant of health? So I start with um, uh, two chapters, basically about the social, ecological and structural determinants of health and how they all come together. So I talk about the Anthropocene and so on. Um, you're gonna see a lot of the chapters integrating these new kinds of, well, they aren't new, but they're more publicly, uh, um, um, uh, known, I guess, um, and and these so so how how all of these things come together to intersect to deepen disadvantage and to enhance wealth and privilege for some. Uh, Dr. Dennis Raphael um, writes about ra raising the volume uh, on the social determinants of health in Canada. That's a call to action. Um, part two of the book is about oppression in the everyday. So how does oppression get under the skin? So Josephine Atoa and I. Uh, talk about um, um, racialization, um, oppression, racialization uh, as a determinant of health. Um, and uh, doctors uh, Marie Batiste and, and Sakij uh, Youngblood Henderson um, talk about oppression and indigenous people's health. Grace Edward Galabuzzi uh, talks about the social exclusion and, as a determinant of health. And I conclude part two with um, the politics of mental health. So um, how does 
pathologizing mental health struggles happen um, and how does that all become a disease and so on. Part three finally is um, about imperatives for structural change, belling the cat, so to speak. Um, Toba Bryant um, talks about oppression and redistributive politics and public policy. Uh, Dr. Sakeed Youngblood Henderson also has a chapter in that, um, in that part. And he talks about uh, Aboriginal people's constitutional right to health and talks a lot about treaty rights too. So, so that's um, a, a very interesting chapter. Do Dr. Joel Lexon's um, chapter is titled Obs Obsessed by Profits, Big Pharma and the Corruption of Health. So you can really see a lot of things coming together in this second edition. Um, and finally, uh, sorry, I join, I join uh, Dr. Lars Hallstrom and we talk about oppression and the political economy of health. Finally, uh, in the last chapter, uh, Dr. Scott Aquano, Toba Bryant, Josephine Atoa, uh, Joel Lexin, Elizabeth, myself, uh, Dennis Raphael, Dennis, uh, Denise Spitzer, Sarah Torres, and uh, we all join uh, to talk about COVID-19 and the, the title of that one is Oppressions Laid Bare. So coming back full circle to what I was talking about, about people under threat. Um, we've also collectively crafted um, a teaching learning guide and toolkit. Uh, so it's a very comprehensive um, guide uh, that'll soon be freely accessible on the, on the um, Fernwood website. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our first guest speaker, Dr. Barry Lavalli, who's a Métis uh, Salto physician in Winnipeg and Chief Executive Officer of Kiwetan Ininu Minoyuin, Inc. Um, so that was established in 2020 uh, to achieve health and wellness um, service, uh, services that are reflective of the needs of, and priorities of First Nations people in Manitoba's North. So welcome, Barry. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for inviting me to uh, say a few words about, uh, uh, you know, when I, I met you, when you, I, I found your book and, and I was using it um, as, a, as a tool uh, to enhance and uh, prioritize um, a different framework for physicians before they go out and practice medicine. And it still is uh, a book that I would recommend for all universities uh, that teach uh, health, uh, nursing, medicine, etc. as a mandatory book. Um, and thank you um, for acknowledging uh, the ongoing genocide of Indigenous peoples, both historical and present. And the, the concept uh, that the, the book really uh, gives to me is that oppression has both uh, past, uh, present and future uh, orientations. And when you add a racial lens onto oppression, it changes it in many ways. Um, and one of the things about oppression is where are we going to go to ensure that there is equity across this country? Uh, for people who are colored, for women, for people who are gay, for people who are disabled, um, et cetera. So one of the big challenges uh, that we see is that white privilege itself is one side of a coin and on the opposite side of the coin uh, for the work that I do is indigenous specific oppression. And it appears that they're inseparable at a micro level so that the changes that occur uh, to address oppression have uh, not only large structural uh, areas that we can work at, but it's really kind of what we do as citizens in this country. Are we prepared to look at that coin and decide how we, uh, for those of us who are privileged, are going to let go of that privilege in order for the opposite side of the coin to have a chance to live? So oppression for me and the work that I do uh, it is really analyzing uh, oppression as a colonial process, uh, which advances uh, really uh, white uh, heteropatriarchy in our country. Um, oppression for Indigenous peoples is about incarceration at the current uh, state. Uh, oppression is about the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The phenomena continues. Um, oppression is about the star light tours in Saskatchewan. And, you know, oppression is about the 215 kids who were found at the residential school in Kamloops. 
and there's going to be more. So oppression itself has material loss, but oppression itself is about genocide. It has specificity. Oppression in Canada, when you're looking at Indigenous peoples, has purpose. And it's around the continuing uh, growing colonial state uh, on our stolen lands. Um, so we're going to find more bodies uh, as, as investigations occur at uh, all the sites where the residential schools are. So we're going to feel this, but feeling it has to take us beyond apathy uh, as Canadians. We, we can't be indifferent to the suffering uh, of people um, when you consider what oppression is. There is a relationship between people who have wealth and have possibility and for people who don't. And we have to make that kind of decision uh, for ourselves. And that's why uh, the book uh, that first and second edition, uh, Dr. McGibbon, my recommendation is that all uh, healthcare providers uh, read that book, both practicing and uh, those being trained at present, because you can't deliver Western medicine to a body without understanding the context of that body and being centered uh, in the experiences of people. And that's really why this book is so important uh, for people to take up and read. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lavallee. Um, our next guest speaker is, is Lucille Harper. And Lucille is a recipient of the Governor General's Persons Case Award. She was executive director of um, of Anti-Ganesh Women's uh, Resource Center uh, from 1988 to 2018, and founder of SAFE, an organization sponsoring uh, Syrian refugee families uh, to place, displaced from their home and, and uh, resettling in Anti-Ganesh. So I'll hand it over to you, Lucille, to, uh, to uh, for your presentation. Thanks, Patty. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. I'm going to stick to my notes because if I divert, I will probably go completely off track. But one of the things that I want to talk about, and I appreciate the comments that have been made, is violence. And I think we don't name violence in, in the ways that it absolutely is part of all of our systems of oppression and uh, and exclusion and, and collusion. And um, included as part of the World Health Organization definition of violence is the intentional use of power, threatened or actual, against person or against a group or community that results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. And I think it permeates our systems. It's, in, it's inherent in the exploitative extractive systems of neoliberal capitalism, entrenched patriarchy, death culture imposed by systems of colonialism and, and the resultant racism, in border imperialism, exploitative immigration policies and temporary foreign worker programs that extract labor without providing permanent residency or even basic rights. It's inherent in all of the intersecting systems that create and maintain inequities and core to the issues that are so well articulated and documented in your book, Elizabeth, Oppression. I live in Nova Scotia uh, where over the past 50 years, we've seen the impact of the decline of primary industries. It's resulted in substantial out migration, serial migration of family members, an aging population, decline in infrastructure, dismantling of rural infrastructure, and regionalization of services. You know, poverty, as we know, is one of the most severe forms of violence. And poverty rates and rates of violence against women and girls in Nova Scotia are high. We've got one of the highest rates of child poverty in Canada, which is a reflection, of course, of family poverty, which is particularly severe for single parent mother led families, immigrant families and indigenous and African Nova Scotian communities. We also have one of the highest rates of sex trafficking and exploitation in Canada. Intimate partner uh, violence rates are high and women living in, in rural areas and much of Nova Scotia is rural. 
experience the highest overall rates of intimate partner violence in Canada and are more likely to be killed by their partners. There's more guns in rural households, women are more isolated, help is further away. So a feminist lens is critical when looking at issues, policies, and structures that impact the health and well-being of individuals, families, and communities. Women are the center of our communities, tasked with responsibility for community building and caretaking on political, social, and familial levels. Caring, sharing, nurturing work is assigned to women, work that is essential, assumed, and devalued. And much of women's work is not financially compensated or it's undercompensated. In March this year, I had the opportunity to facilitate a series of 11 community consultations to inform na a national action plan on gender-based violence. And I met with 75 diverse participants from indigenous African Nova Scotian immigrant refugee communities, small rural communities and gender diverse communities. I wanted to bring because those conversations so echoed the, the themes and issues that were raised in the book. So cross-cutting themes in all of these conversations were poverty, violence against women and girls, racism, access to relevant services, the impact of systems oppression, lack of voice, and rural marginalization, and the imposition of urban-centric solutions. So I want to speak briefly to some of the issues that they raised. So they talked about the way that systems contribute to silencing women and survivors of gender-based violence. They said, for fear of retribution and because of biases within systems, many victim survivors of violence do not come forward for help. Survivors of childhood sexual abuse remain silent. Women who are prostituted remain silent. Women who experience violence and non-state torture in their homes remain silent. Women and girls who experience violence in healthcare facilities remain silent. Women and girls in foster homes and safe houses remain silent. Members of the trans and queer community remain silent. Survivors of violence against women and girls in the queer and trans community are often misdiagnosed, overmedicated, and mistreated within the healthcare system. And this can take many forms as largely unrecognized. And misogyny and patriarchy in the healthcare system, as it is across all systems, <clears throat> continues to harm women in many ways, including dismissing our voices. Women noted that human trafficking, and this is in some of our very, very small rural communities, noted that human trafficking, an extractive, exploitative industry that dehumanizes women and girls, and to which Indigenous women are particularly vulnerable, is prevalent in many rural communities. Often women in rural communities are forced to use prostitution to meet bare economic essentials, including food, housing, heat, and transportation. Today, the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association is heading an effort to stop the development of a liquid natural gas plant in the small community of Goldboro. They know both the impact on the environment and the violence and sexual exploitation perpetrated upon Indigenous women when man camps are established near their communities. And one of the things that I learned yesterday is that I'm sure most of you have heard about Pornhub and some of the some of the efforts to try to close that down. Canada is among the top five consumers of Pornhub, you know, and that impact on health and well-being is hugely significant and not not talked about. They talked about women talked a lot about poverty, poverty is gendered, policy created, and systems maintained. Poverty is time and labor intensive. Women who live in poverty, people who live in poverty work really long days uh, just to try to survive. It increases women's vulnerability to violence and sexual exploitation. It leads to the loss of educated community builders as people move out of our smaller communities. Uh, it leads to the loss that out migration leads to the loss of infrastructure with the closure and centralization of schools, hospitals, grocery stores, gas stations. Sometimes you have to drive close to 100 kilometers here to find a gas station. Uh, 
The reduction or, or complete withdrawal of mental health services, social services, and employment support services from most rural communities has left many communities without support they need to ensure people are cared for. We work a lot, uh, I work a lot with uh, refugee immigrants, and it's been a real insight into the Canadian policies on, on refugees and, and immigrants where, you know, so interesting as a colonial country, now that we're here and now that we've taken over and now that we've taken the land, we're stopping other people from coming. Um, the skills and professional degrees of immigrants are too often not recognized. They're unable to secure work in their fields without extensive and expensive certification and re-education. It's frustrating, demeaning. Women are particularly isolated often um, leaving them very financially dependent on their partners and all of this increases their vulnerability for abuse. The threat of de deportation, so which is another systems issue, which is really, um, when we think about violence and, and the violence of systems, deportation is hugely, hugely violent response to somebody who is trying to find safety and establish a life in Canada. People don't go, newcomers don't go to the police. They're afraid of the police. They're afraid of legal systems. They don't know what to expect and worry it could affect their immigration status. And I could go on. What we know is that eliminating poverty is not difficult. This is not, it's not difficult. It does mean thoughtful and deliberate systemic and policy changes that value all life on our planet and our interconnection and our interdependence. Uh, it requires that we ground our thinking in values of caring, sharing, and nurturing, reciprocity, sharing our common wealth, where the harms created to people in our planet by systems of exploitation that create and maintain wealth and well being inequities are challenged and replaced. We need to review every policy decision through the lenses of economic, social, environmental, and gender justice. And I'm very thankful for your book. Elizabeth, and I'm very thankful to everyone here who does the work that you do for change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucille. Our next uh, speaker is Tari Ajabi, uh, who is a PhD uh, candidate in political science at Dalhousie University. He's also a board member of the Health Association of African Canadians. And I'll hand it over to you, Terry, to share your insights as well. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all for, having, for hosting this event. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the folks at Fermo Publishing. And thank you, of course, to Elizabeth for your uh, excellent leadership. I'll, I'll be very brief with my comments. Um, I, you know, I work, I currently work uh, for Elizabeth as a research assistant um, on her Shirk project on health equity discourses. And Elizabeth was also, um, a uh, member of my master's committee. So I've, I've been able to see up close just her incredible leadership, uh, her insight and her ability to map out key connections between uh, the lived experiences of people every day struggling under the yoke of oppression and the kind of uh, policy import and systemic connections that perpetuate um, and kind of make that oppression durable within the context of our societies. So that's that's just a note there. I think that this volume really helps to highlight um, just how profoundly entrenched um, issues of racism, settler colonialism um, and, and sexism amongst many other issues are within the context of Canadian society. And as for someone, uh, as a scholar who tries to also bridge their work with uh, activist work, including work uh, on the issue of defunding the police, this, this book operates as a really excellent kind of toolkit to understand and to internalize the connections between these broader issues and their impact on our health. Um, so I would encourage everyone on the call to pick up a copy if they haven't already. Um, and certainly I think that it's important for us to reflect on the interconnectedness of systems within the context of our society and how they perpetuate and deepen issues of oppression uh, for folks who have been marginalized 
i.e. people who are under threat, under the threat of violence um, and exploitation by an unjust state. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the speakers. Thanks very much again for having me. Thank you, Tari. Um, and, and I'm also on, honored to introduce uh, three contributors uh, that Elizabeth has already mentioned, three contributors to the book who are with us today and willing to share insight into their work. So we'll start with Dr. Denise Spitzer. Um, Dr. Spitzer is a, a professor and scientist at the Center for Healthy Communities at the University of Alberta School of Public Health. And, um, and Dr. Spitzer, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. And I'd also uh, like to extend my thanks on behalf of myself and my, my co-author, Dr. Sarah Torres, uh, for this opportunity to participate in this volume. It's, uh, really, uh, I feel really honored to, uh, to be part of this, this group of, of, of scholars and activists. And, and I've been really honored to be part of this forum to hear these uh, really eloquent comments uh, around oppression. And these are issues, of course, that um, I deeply share. Um, not only, and I love the fact that you talked about righteous anger, because I really spend my time in rage, the older I get. So, um, and I'm hoping that that is a flame that stays with me for as long as I am breathing, honestly. So I'm speaking to you today from unceded Algonquin territory in, um, in Ottawa. And uh, we'll talk to you a bit about uh, the work that uh, Sarah and I did on uh, immigrant health. Economic or family class immigrant, migrant worker, refugee, refugee claimant, documented, undocumented. These are all terms used to describe the more than 20% of the Canadian population who are foreign born. Now each of these categories turns on notions of voluntariness of movement and carries with it implications around presumed education and skills, their ability to supposedly integrate into Canadian society. In reality, this Categories are slippery and complex. For example, documented and migration status can fluctuate over time. Refugees, often portrayed in our public discourse as kind of the great unwashed, um, include physicians, engineers, computing scientists, as well as shopkeepers and peasants. But some immigrants may be best regarded even as Volu involuntary voluntary migrants. Sometimes if you are moving with a family, you, you know, not everybody in the family is really that interested in, in uh, leaving their home country. And some, of course, many immigrants living in countries where neoliberal globalization has resulted in conditions where they are unable to even barely you know, find remunerative work, regardless of their education or experience, are compelled to make a, quote, choice, unquote, to migrate, a choice that is, in fact, no choice at all. Migration status, particularly upon entry to a destination country, places newcomers under a trajectory that will shape their access to determinants of health. Racism, sexism, heterosexism have always been entrenched in Canadian immigration policies as our history of exclusionary policies attests. Currently, certainly racialized persons from the global south are more likely to be recruited into temporary migrant categories, while permanent resettlement is increasingly reserved for immigrants from the north or global knowledge workers. With regards to gender, Women immigrants in heterosexual relationships are often designated as a dependent of a male um, principal applicant. And this distinction enshrines their dependency on their male companions and shapes their access to programs, including official language training. Despite the fact that foreign born Canadians are better educated than the Canadian populace, they're more apt to be underemployed, to experience chronic low income, and to report a greater mismatch between their education and their occupation. Racialized migrants face even greater downward mobility, with racialized women who are overrepresented in the lowest echelons of the labor market, most notably in precarious labor characterized by low wages, few if any benefits, and chronic uncertainty, reporting the most precipitous decline in health status after migrating to Canada. While the deprivations of poverty and poor working conditions, low quality housing, and nutrition contribute to poor health outcomes, Migrants also confront yet another issue, and that is one of discrepant expectations that I think are also sort of really underpinned by various forms of structural and 
racism. Potentially overeducated and underemployed, migrating to another uh, in hopes of a better life, one for which one is in fact worked, but whose fulfillment is thwarted is a dream that is dashed, not deferred. And that, in fact, is a potent and a chronic stressor, one that underpins, I think, the loss of uh, health status. Sometimes the stress results in an identifiable disorder, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and sometimes in amorphous pain, suffering that has no biomedical uh, classification. Now, all of these responses to physical, social, political, and personal environment can be regarded as the embodiment of inequalities of that getting under the skin, or what we sometimes call oppression illness. Then came the pandemic. Certainly COVID-19 has laid bare both the inequalities that are entrenched in Canadian society and our dependence on primarily racialized migrants who comprise a disproportionate percentage of designated essential workers in both service work, including care labor and food processing industries. Members of racialized communities, and again, including many migrants, are engaged in employment where workers are in close proximity with one another, with fragile care recipients, or with other publics as in customer service, sometimes residing in employer-owned or managed congregate settings or cramped rental accommodation. Added to these stressors has been the widespread vile pandemic racism, sometimes expressed in violent attacks or verbal outbursts that we hear about, but also embedded in public discourses that identify racialized migrants as vectors of disease. In addition to the uh, outbreaks in long-term care facilities, major uh, COVID-19 outbreaks have occurred in meat processing and agricultural workplaces. In April 2020, the Cargill meatpacking plant in southern Alberta became the largest outbreak in North America. Prior to its temporary closure, employees had already complained amongst themselves about being pressured to continue to work or to return to work while still ill, and about the lack of safety equipment, measures that would uh, perhaps uh, mitigate exposures, and information about um, the pandemic all compounding existing uh, concerns about health and safety and the factor. 85% of Cargill employees, when uh, they were uh, surveyed by the union, feared returning to work after there was a shutdown. Between 70 and 80% of the workforce of that plant were migrant workers, primarily from the Philippines. Some were permanent residents, others were on temporary work visas and feared, in fact, that their work visas might lapse due to uh, these lockdown measures, which would cause them, of course, to fall into undocumented status. The tenuous nature of their migration status, the need to provide for families in Canada or send remittances to family members in their home countries has always made it misty to, to complain. And this uh, certainly exacerbated the issue. Migrants have been subject, as we know, to higher rates of morbidity and mortality but also increased precarity as the uh, pandemic is unfolding. A plant in central Alberta this year engaged in a voluntary shutdown, laid off, and then later rehired its workforce, underscoring, I think, the disposability of these workers um, whose engagement with precarious labor is, in fact, merely reflection of precarious lives. Now, Dr. McGibbon asked us to comment on what we think is most urgent. So here, in fact, is my urgent message. Uh, might not be uh, speaking, uh, obviously speaking to the choir here, but clearly the complex, uh, complete, uh, complex nexus of social and political economic factors that contribute to health disparities have been exacerbated by the current pandemic. The pandemic has also torn off some of the veneer of Canada's self-image to reveal the structural inequalities that underpin our social and economic infrastructure. But it has also revealed the critical contributions of migrants to Canadian society and the economy. So I think, in fact, this is a moment for the Canadian pu public to take a good hard look. And let's not be satisfied with this notion of returning to normal. I hear this all the time, and frankly, I don't want to return to normal. Um, but this, in fact, could be a pivotal moment, a time uh, when we can collectively work to address the gendered, racialized, social and economic inequities and precariousness that plague many migrants in this country. A time for regularization of all migrant workers, for redressing immigration policies that reinforce gendered um, and racialized inequalities. A time, in fact, for greater unionization, um, to call for decent wages and work for all. It's a time to address the oppression 
of, of, of all peoples, of migrants, of indigenous peoples, of people who identify as women and other communities under threat. In fact, an equitable and inclusive society is a healthier society. So I will end there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Spitzer. Next is Dr. Lars Hallstrom, uh, who is a professor at the University of Lethbridge and director of Prentice Institute for Global Population and Economy. And I'll hand it over you to, to you, Dr. Hallstrom. Great, thank you so much, Patty, and to Liz as well. And I use these as terms as a former colleague at St. FX. I joined the faculty at St. FX almost uh, 20 years, less than a month or so ago. And I see lots of familiar faces and all I will say is there's clearly something um, in the water because nobody seems to be aging in Antigonish. And Colleen Cameron, I'm looking right at you. 15 years later, she looks exactly the same, um, as does everybody else, apparently. Um, so thank you very much. It's always been a real pleasure for me to be part of um, this book and this authorial enterprise with um, Liz. And to see, I was really pleased to see a second edition to come out. Of course, was really happy and honored to be asked to contribute to that, um, in part because I think starting from the very title, uh, this book and the, the sentiment and the spirit of what is being written about um, from the contributors in the broader editorial process aligns both with my work first um, at St. FX and Social Determinants of Health, then at the University of Alberta for 12 years running the Rural Research Center at the U of A and, and dealing with on the ground many of the issues that Lucille has pointed to and that Denise has pointed to as well in terms of rural, in terms of public health, in terms of capacity, um, but also to really now at the University of Lethbridge, really come to terms with the fact that as a political scientist, and this is, you know, writing this chapter with Liz has always helped bring me focus to my thinking about the politics and the public policy questions of the social determinants of health, of health and environmental inequities, and to frame them in light of oppression. And I think, um, as was pointed out, the return to normal, unfortunately for, uh, for Canada, is really a question we need to engage with and that this book helps us uh, and allows us to think about. I, I fear that in Canada, we've, um, we've washed away the realities of our own histories as a settler country. And in doing so, um, we tend to think about oppression as something that happens elsewhere. It happens in the United States, it happens in Europe, and it ha happened in, in Europe. It happens maybe in areas um, of the developing world. And our, our identity, uh, as Tari, I think, pointed out as well, is really grounded in uh, not engaging with the realities of our political uh, structures and economic and structures as they relate to race, to identity, to equality, to equity, to health. And I think it's important to, to name and consider, um, as the, the first speaker, Dr. Lavallee did, um, to, to name genocide. When we see something that does actually correspond to genocide, um, it is not something that just happens somewhere else. Uh, but we need to layer that into all of these other dimensions of oppression that permeate down into the identity and the mindset of not just policymakers, but of citizens, um, of voters, of people who seek office in, in rural areas. And this includes the perpetual and continuous greenwashing of environmental politics in this country. Canada has an incredibly poor environmental record in terms of performance, but we tout ourselves as being very pro-environment. We tout ourselves as being very equitable and socially and economically and culturally equitable, while in fact we are not. We don't like to talk about the realities of rural versus urban spaces, particularly, as Lucille pointed out, when it comes to issues of sexual violence, when it comes to issues of gender and identity, when it comes to issues of income and economic development and vulnerability um, precariousness, particularly for women, and particularly then again for women of certain educational profiles. And what I've found most helpful from this book and from the contributions that people have made is it opens up a space to start to get into the mindset of oppression, and in particular, what an oppression of the mind means. So not just the physical or overt expression of power, which is a classic political and sociological 
question, but particularly now having sat back in Alberta for the last 12 years, to realize just how insidious different forms of what Foucault and others have called governmentality really are, how we can convince ourselves that what we're doing is the right thing and the only thing to be done, that we cannot imagine alternatives, that we cannot think about things other than freedom and individual choice and equality of opportunity versus equality of condition, that we become, and I get to live this almost every day, and in fact, the reason that I was thinking about this is less than an hour ago, I was in a meeting with a, a research assistant and the topic of gender inequity and salaries came up, particularly around uh, academic salaries as an example. And her response was, but it's, it's their choice. They choose the career paths that lead to less salaries. They, they're making a, co a conscious choice. And my point was at an individual level, perhaps, but again, that choice is structured by all kinds of other things. But when this is aggregated across an, an entire sector, across the country, regardless of province or location, it starts to speak and to this younger generation about how they internalize and understand what equity and equality mean and what choice and freedom really mean. And so I, th I think it's very important as we move forward to think about the political structures that inform and reinforce the paths that we take, the choices that we take. And this includes, just to build uh, upon the, the comments from from Dr. Spitzer, when we look at COVID laying bare the reality of inequities and inequalities um, across Canada, the, the common narrative that we're hearing, at least here in Alberta, in many cases at the political level, is about first, second, and third wave. But I wanna just show you something to show how this is not actually the lived experience of different um, parts of the country, assuming that I can Share the right thing. Can you all see COVID rates over the course of the pandemic? Should be a graphic, yes. If you look here, here's the overall provincial three waves, right? Since uh, last year. But as we scroll down, what you'll notice, this is ordered by population. As we move out of the cities, which follow larger three wave patterns, we start to see a lot of variation we see a lot of rural communities that did not really have first waves or had first waves that aligned with second waves. A couple of outliers, Newell was one of the sites that was uh, identified. It was a, a larger agricultural industrial complex. But as you look, as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, the diversity of experience across the board is extremely varied, both in terms of severity, but also frequency. Some communities have had four or five different waves. And in fact, what we see is, despite this reality, a common discourse in many rural areas that COVID is an urban problem, that it doesn't happen here, that somehow rural communities are immune to this dynamic. Yet we also know that in these same rural communities, it is the most vulnerable who bear the weight of those different waves and the local decisions to not engage or deal with the realities of those different um, epidemiological vectors. So congratulations, Liz, and to all of the contributors and to everybody here. I saw there's something like 50 plus people attending today. It's absolutely fantastic. And so nice to see so many familiar faces, even if you're not getting any older. And uh, thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Myers. Um, our next contributor is Dr. Joel Lexton, and uh, he is an emergency physician with the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, he is also Professor Emeritus at the York University School of Health Policy and Management. And so I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Lexton. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, and thank you to Elizabeth for the honor of contributing to this um, amazing book, which were I still teaching, I would be sure to order. Um, so my chapter in this book deals with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and the, the oppression that comes out of the pharmaceutical industry is based on its obsession um, with earning profits. 
So we need to be clear about that, that the pharmaceutical industry is not in business to help people. The pharmaceutical industry is in business to make money and specifically to make money um, for the people who are leading the industry. Um, an interesting, the industry often talks about um, how much money it puts into research and development. But if you look at the past 20 years of history of the industry of the largest 20 companies, what you see is that they spend more money on share buybacks and dividends than they do on research and development. And the reason for that is that what they're doing by buying back shares and is decreasing the number of shares that are out there, that increases the value of the remaining shares. Um, and then they pay dividends on those shares. And who are the largest shareholders? It's the, the executives of those companies. So what they're doing is that they're driving up how much money they make um, and they're not really putting their money into the research and development into diseases that are important um, to, to the world. If you look at things like the um, investment in R&D into what are called neglected diseases or least or most neglected diseases, those are the ones that um, are found in low and middle income countries predominantly, you see that about 0.1% of the, um, the drugs that have been developed over the past couple of decades have actually been targeted at those diseases. The drug companies, as I said, are in business to make money. Um, and if we forget that, then we lose sight of why we're in the situation that we're currently in. Um, and one of those, one of the situations is how much we're spending on drugs in Canada right now. Canada happens to have about the fourth highest um, drug prices in the world. And in terms of per capita spending, in other words, how much per person per year is spent on prescription drugs, we're about number three. Um, there are some efforts that are being made to try and deal with that through changes in something called the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. Um, those are being opposed very aggressively by industry. They're supposed to come into effect on July the 1st of this year. They were supposed to come into effect on July the 1st of 2020. Then they were supposed to come into effect on January 1st, 2021. And now we're looking at them coming into effect in a few weeks, hopefully. Um, the reason that they've been delayed was because of significant pressure from the industry on the Canadian government, not just directly from the industry, but also from patient groups that the industry funds. Patient groups are very effective in being able to influence public policy because they're not being seen as um, they're, they're seen as not after money, they're seen as looking after the, their membership. Um, that's partly true, but patient groups are heavily funded by industry and there's research out there to show that when you take money from companies, your policies align with those of the companies. Um, the other aspect that we see in terms of profit being the driving force behind the pharmaceutical industry is what's going on in um, with the COVID vaccine, um, the vaccines. Um, this is a, an utter disaster um, in terms of the international community. Um, back at the start of the pandemic, or slightly after the start, back in June of 2020, there was a something set up or called CTAP, um, COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, backed by the World Health Organization, supported or, by um, the president of Costa Rica and the, um, and 
eventually about 40 countries. Um, Canada, unfortunately, was not one of those countries. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, this was set up to be a voluntary pool where companies could donate um, patents, other technology um, and knowledge so that everybody could make use of those products in fighting COVID. To date, not a single company has contributed to COVID-19, to the CTAP. The other aspect of the um, problem that we see with respect to companies and their greed comes with the um, opposition to the patent waiver um, that's being debated at the, um, at the World Trade Organization. This is an effort to temporarily suspend patents and other forms of um, knowledge to allow for the much wider um, manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines. Right now, the estimates are that if the world that the world capacity for making a COVID vaccine is about 4 billion doses a year. We need at least 11 billion doses to fully immunize the entire world. So even if every company that's currently making vaccines was producing at its capacity, we still couldn't get anywhere near immunizing the entire world. That's why we need a much higher level of production. And that's behind this patent waiver proposal that's come out of India and South Africa um, to allow companies in other countries where the capacity exists to also make COVID vaccines. This is being opposed again by all of the drug companies. None of them have voiced any support for it. Um, and it's also being opposed by a lot of countries around the world, most of the European Union countries, and unfortunately, Canada in addition. Canada's position with respect to um, what's going on with COVID um, re really reflects our relationships with the pharmaceutical industry. We've had a long history of cooperation with the industry. Um, you go back a hundred years and you see that, and it goes, it carries forward to the present and it's amplified by the neoliberalism that's developed, neoliberal philosophy that's developed over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, in, you look at it from in Canada's terms in the past 20 or so years, there have been about six or seven episodes where Canada has, could make a choice between improving access to pharmaceuticals in, develop, in low and middle income countries versus protecting patent rights um, for the pharmaceutical industry. And every time Canada has had that choice, to make, it's made it in favor of the industry. It's prioritized protecting patents, intellectual property rights over access to medications. We're doing that currently um, with the COVID-19 vaccine. This is despite an, an op-ed uh, about a year ago in the Washington Post that was written by a number of world leaders the first of which was Justin Trudeau. Justin's message at that point was, everybody needs to be vaccinated for everybody to be safe. Unfortunately, that's just an example of liberal rhetoric um, because Canada has done nothing um, to advance that. We've now committed to donating 13 million doses of um, COVID vaccines we have ordered something like enough vaccine to immunize the entire Canadian population four times over. And we've got on reserve, or we've got the potential 
to order enough further vaccines to immunize the Canadian population another three times. And yet at this point, we're willing to donate a measly 13 million doses and there's no timeline put on it. So I'll just end by saying that what we're seeing from the industry is the obsession with profits, how that affects access and prices to medications in Canada, how that affects the um, attitude of the Canadian government to getting vaccines out to the rest of the world. Um, and basically it's a disaster. We should be ashamed of ourselves in Canada. We should be ashamed of um, letting the industry dictate what we're doing in terms of helping the rest of the world and the Canadian population. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Lexkin. So that um, so so we've gotten through the, our guest speakers and our contributors, and now we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. And uh, so uh, I see Lars's hands up, and others can put their hands up or put put uh, put your comments in the chart chat. So I'll hand it over to everyone to uh, to ask questions. Um, I think Lars, you put your oh you were clapping okay. <laughs> Lars was clapping. So any, 